Hey everyone, on today's episode, Chris and I are talking all about the top three sales objections that contractors are getting and how to overcome them. Check it out. Hey everyone, welcome back to Contractor Growth Network. I'm Logan. And I'm Chris Livingston. And today we're talking all about sales objections that a lot of homeowners are giving to contractors. Chris, you like this topic? I do. Good. Uh, <laughs> Let's continue to go forward on this conversation. So right now, it's the busy season. If you're listening to this, uh, as soon as it releases, it's probably going to be May 2021. But this stuff doesn't matter if it's May 2021, November 2016. It doesn't matter what the time is. It's the same objections every single time. Yet, it's funny. Contractors, they get the same. We're just going to go with the big three objections here. Yet what they do is they never figure out how to overcome them or how to deal with them or how to guide somebody down that path. I, I want to talk about the tactics of the, handling the objections. But before we do that, are you cool with just kind of talking about like where objections come from? Sure. Uh, so straight up from you, I mean, I have my own opinion on this, but what do obje objections come from? Like where, where are they stemming from? A lack of trust. Yeah. Lack of clarity. So if you are able to get in front of that, you can reduce the number of objections that you have. But if you still are getting a lot of these same objections, a lack, lack of trust, lack of clarity on your, your process, lack of clarity on what this stuff costs, lack, lack of clarity on if you are you know, the right fit, then you're able to utilize these tactics as well. But I think understanding the origin of objections will allow for you to be able to handle them even better than what we're going to explain right here on this call. So the caveat to all this, guys, is if you're at the point where people are throwing out a lot of price objections or the talk, you know, oh, I need to talk to my spouse and you're getting that all the time. You failed already because you should not get to the point where you're dealing with that. People should know this stuff up front because essentially the way that the world is going at this point and CarMax really kicked it on off is essentially up front. We're trying to tell people, hey, look, based on what you may or may not talk to me about is this is a ballpark of what it's going to cost. And then here's essentially what I want to work through with you to essentially sell you. This is what I want to sell you on. You don't say it that way because then it comes off negatively. But if people feel like you're being very transparent up front and saying this is a ballpark of what it's going to cost and this is why I'm worth that plus how my process is operated and from a logistical standpoint what this will look like, that is when the big dogs will win because 80% yep. of the sale happens before you actually talk to a salesman. So right now, if you're getting to the point where you're trying to like navigate these waters, it's because you're focusing on the 20% instead of focusing on the 80%, which is really, if you focus on that, most of these objections, you're not really going to have those anymore. Yep. But we're going to go through it anyway, because I know a lot of people refuse to focus on the 80%. They love doing it the hard way and they love doing the 20%. Totally agree. And I think having a process and having an agenda and not necessarily in, that comes off in a bad way, but having a process and having a structure behind your calls, structure behind your process allows for you to be able to handle those objections more, you know, easily. And then also allows for your customer to feel taken care of. So then they are more trusting of you in the entire process. So let's walk through that. What is the value of a sales process? Why is it important to have one versus winging it every time? And when you, I guess I can answer that question, but are you saying right now from the homeowner's perspective or from the contractor's perspective? It's pretty mutually agreeable. You know, it benefits both. So let's just take it from the contractor's perspective first. Why should a contractor have a sales process in place? And well, first off, before we even do that, should we go? Hey, I'm sorry. Let's go through that and then I'll ask what is a sales process, but let's do that first. Why? Gotcha. So Why? First and foremost, I have a clear understanding of where each person's at. I can, it's like herding cats. I can be able to get people to go from browsers to buyers. I can help solve their problem more effectively. Um, having a process behind it allows me to not have to run around like a, like a chicken with my head cut off. I'm able to say, okay, this person is right here. The next step for them to to happen is everyone around me knows that the next step for them to happen is the, is this step, right? So if they had the initial phone call with me, great. The next step for them to do is fill out you know my form, send over some pictures. All right. The next step from that is to have a, a call. So we all know what the next steps are, and that allows for me. Who's to, we all? Sorry, everyone in the company. 
right? Yeah. So that's everyone from the contractor to if you have an admin person, whoever that may be. So, hey, this person sent over pictures. They're not looking at you like, oh, what's the next step? They understand, of, okay, well, now they're looking for a phone call. Okay, they haven't had their phone call yet. Great. Let me set you up with the next person. Okay. So what if you're just a one-man operation though? What's the benefit of having it then? Well, once again, now you have a clear understanding because I hear so many people talking about, oh, I don't have enough time. And I think a lot of it's just wasted time. We, we're using, we're not prepared to spend our time in the most effective way. So if you have a sales process, then you're able to walk people down this process, have a clear understanding of where everybody is. And then at the end of the day, you are positioning yourself as someone who knows what they're doing. So it's not just some like chuck in the truck operation. And do homeowners like that working with somebody who knows what they're doing? hundred percent. They're looking for a guide. Correct. Let's flip it around. Why is it important for a contractor to have a sales process from a homeowner's perspective? Um, because I'm taken care of. I have this pain I'm dealing with and I'm looking for someone to help guide me from where I am right now to where I want to go. And if they have a process, then I can be able to lean on that process of, okay, yeah, I feel comforted. If you were going uh, from a flight from Atlanta to LA and you, you know, everybody just kind of showed up around the plane. There's no person taking the bags. There's no, hey, where do I do this? They hop on the plane. They don't know who's going to fly the plane. You know, they're trying to pick someone out in the crowd. And then you guys are flying and, and no one has any idea what the process looks like versus, okay, hey, I got to go through TSA. After TSA, I go to my gate. After I go to my gate, I hop on the plane. I board. Once I get on the plane, I'm going to fly. The stewardess is, you know, stewardess is going to give me, uh, the, flight, flight attendant. I apologize. The flight attendant. The flight attendant is going to give me all the instructions I need to have, you know, pre-flight, within the flight, take care of me. We're going to land. I'm going to exit the plane. I'm gonna, so it's, it's, it's just so structured simple. and everybody knows and everybody knows what to expect. Now, Chris, when people are saying things right now, like, well, I need help with lead management. What does that mean to you? That they need a process and they need help being able to hone in on this process and some tools to make that process more effective and also easier. So why are they dealing with a lead management? Well, first off, like to you, what, what does lead management issue mean? Well, just not, not having a process that is effective for them and their homeowner. Because just because you have a process and the, if the homeowner is not willing to follow it, then you know, you're kind of SOL in that situation. And everyone has a process. Uh, sometimes your process is a different one every single time, but you have a process and maybe that process is inconsistency, but you have a process and you need to have one that is both beneficial for you and also for the homeowner. So the point behind why we, we need to have a process in my mind is imagine you're a home builder and the first thing you always got to do is you got to lay the foundation of the house. Yeah. But let's just say this time we go, man, eh, let's just put the, no, let's do the framing first. Then we'll start to put up the drywall. Then we'll put the foundation down. Does that work? No. Why? Because you have unsteady ground. It's not the right process to go forward with something. Correct. Like and in your own business, the way that you build, you probably have a very set process of doing things where you're not starting with brand new, you know, a different material every time. You're not starting from scratch, you know, and reinventing the wheel every time you build something. Yet when it comes to how you sell, how you operate, Right. If you have, let's say, a follow up system where you want to follow up with leads, if you know on day one, day three, day four, day seven, and day nine, you're going to call them. And every day in between, then you're going to email them, which sounds like a lot, um, but just giving you a frame of reference. If you do that and you see it works, well, great. Now you know it works. But if you do all that and it doesn't work, well, now you know to shift and move. But if with one lead, you call them on day four and day nine, and that's it. And the next lead, you call them on day one, and that's it. Like we don't know what works. So how can you ever get better at something if you're changing it every single time? It's tough. What I'm hearing from most people and probably what I'm dealing with myself as I close on this home is the communication piece. And if I, this person has a process, I have a clear understanding of when I should be able to, my next touch point. You know, for this whole build right now that I'm dealing with, I don't- And, and just for frame of reference, Chris is- uh, he bought a home that's being built right now. So that's what he's referring to. Gotcha. Appreciate that. So gotcha. <laughs> Didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Somebody tell Megan. Who's Chris? <laughs> but so for that frame of reference is I, I understand I'm not building this home. All right. So, and I understand that there's gonna be different factors that are gonna allow it to be, you know, happen earlier or later. I just want to be in the know of where I am at in this process. So that I can take care of my things, you know, Hey, 
is, is a lender situation already taken care of? You know, should we have already gotten the refrigerator? You know, what about other appliances? So understanding where you are in the process is super important for me as a consumer. So if you have a process and people always talk about, oh, my communication is great. All right. But is your communication working for you? Do you have a process that you're able to say, hey, at this point, you know that I will communicate this to you. So you don't have to be left in the dark because as a consumer, no matter what you're buying, that's maybe your your most your biggest frustration. You're sitting you're sitting at the restaurant and you ordered this a long time ago. You have no idea when when it's coming out. You've been sitting there for forever. If the you know if the hostess comes up to you and says, "Hey, um, you know your food's actually gonna come out in about 15 minutes from now. We actually had a little we're a little bit behind." That gives me peace of mind to understanding an idea of expectations. So what you're saying is people are not so frustrated necessarily with like, hey, I've got a lead time of a week. They're more frustrated with the fact that you're not communicating that with them. So it's time to start to communicate that more. 100%. And with this last caveat on the sales process, guys, a lot of this stuff, again, 80% of people are going to be buying before they even call you. They're already mentally bought in or they're already mentally checked out based on what they're seeing online, based on what they're seeing with reviews, based on what they're seeing in their neighborhood. So if you're not focusing on the 80% and you right now you're just going, well, I just want a couple of tactics on how to sell. Well, you're going to know how to nail it on the 20%, but you're going to skip over the other 80%. So you're ready to jump into actually some role play and go through the top three different objections that we hear. Let's go for it. Cool. So we're going to do price first. Chris, what percentage of people here do you think hear the objection of that's oh, too much money? Um, I would say, I mean, everybody does. Cause it yeah, 100%. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if you're doing handyman services to you're doing custom builds that are, you know, a million dollars plus. It's the reality is for somebody, that's more money than they expect it to pay. And again, that's back to not having a process up front that educates people that does the CarMax model. So uh, let's go through that, Chris. So do you want to play the contractor or you want to play the homeowner? Whatever is easiest for you. All right, I'll be a homeowner. You ready? All right, sounds All right. good. So Chris, all right, man, a uh, million dollars for a home, like that. that's that's a lot more money than I wanted to spend. That's a lot. Okay. Um, just curious, what do you mean? Uh, well, I guess coming into this, um, I was thinking maybe 600 grand on a home. Um, I wasn't really ready to spend a million dollars. So it's just, it's a lot more than I thought. Okay. Can I, can I kind of share with you? I normally have two different types of clients. Can I kind of share with the, those two different types of clients with you? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. So the first client that I normally work with is someone who has this idea of exactly what they want. And by, by no means is it ever a, a compromise to change that idea. They've got this idea in their head and they want to get it. So price necessarily is not the biggest factor for them. All right. For other people, it, sometimes they do kind of have a budget, right? So they maybe have this idea of exactly what they want, um, but they're able to bend that a little bit so that they can be best taken care of within their price range. I guess for you, so I can best take care of you. Which one best describes you? Um, for me, I mean, like I have a little bit of wiggle room, but not 600 grand up to a million. That's kind of a lot. Okay. Do you, do you mind sharing me so I can be able to take care of you? Like what, what your wiggle room looks like or what you got are hoping to spend? Probably high end 700. Okay. So it sounds like if we get around that $700 range, $700,000 range, then, and we're able to accomplish what we want to accomplish, you'll be happy with that. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. So let's talk about that. Um, you're probably going to hate me for saying this, but there may be, when we went through the things we talked about, there may be a few things we kind of have to take off. Or what are your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm okay with, with taking some stuff off. Um, I guess what, what do we need to take out? And, and that would kind of depend on you. So we can do a couple different things. I can kind of explain to you if you're okay with it, just a couple of things that drive the cost up and some things that kind of keep it relatively closer to our range. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. So it's, it's different things. So maybe from materials, maybe, you know, lead times on certain, you know, certain items. Uh, let's do this. Let's kind of walk through your list of what you want to have. And then we will kind of put priorities on the most important thing. So can you kind of go, we talked about a little bit about that, you know, the home. And for most people, what they're looking for is a kitchen is the center piece of their home, the bedrooms, and maybe any additional room. All right. So are in your world right now, is there of those, are those the three things that are basic for you? Or are you looking for something outside of there that's super important to having in your home? No, like the kitchen is big. Um, you know, having four bedrooms is also pretty important. 
So I guess for me, you know, having the kitchen and, and having four bedrooms is like, you know, the most important pieces to it. Gotcha. Is there anything else? Because sometimes I talk to people and it's about, you know, outdoor, the outdoor area. They spend a lot of time outdoors or maybe they, you know, they have accustomed to using their garage for a lot more. Uh, for you, is there anything spe special like, hey, Chris, at the end of this, I know I talked to you about $700,000 and I want to make sure that this comes in with that as well. Uh, that, I mean, that's, that's mainly it. There's a few other things that, you know, like nice appliances, like nice refrigerator. I'm really looking forward to that because I keep seeing them online and they look really cool. Um, and then having for the master bathroom, having like a standalone bathtub. Okay. Gotcha. So if we're taking care of the bathroom, we're taking care of, so, so along with those bedrooms and just so I understand like the, the bedrooms, how do you guys plan on using those bedrooms? Uh, to sleep. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I kind of probably, uh, phrase that in the wrong way. So sometimes I'll talk to people and they, they're, you know, necessarily empty nesters, but they're having their families come in all the time or they're having a lot of visitors. Or sometimes it's just, you know, think about possibly Airbnb their place out. When I talked to you earlier, I, I thought it was just you and, and your wife and I might've been off on that, but how do you guys plan on, how you guys plan on seeing using the other three bedrooms in the house? Oh yeah. So for right now, I mean, we'll probably have one just cause we're still working from home during all this. We'll have one set up as like an office as a makeshift office, but uh, we are empty nesters, but our, our kids are probably going to have grandkids soon. So to be able to have them come over and actually feel comfortable in our home. Um, so for the most part, they're going to be empty, but they will be used for guest rooms, essentially. Okay. So for you in that world, uh, how many of those you feel like consistently you're going to have to use for guest rooms? Uh, probably. I mean, so if you have four bedrooms, one's going to be a master, which means that we have three non, and then probably two would be a guest room. And then one would just, I guess, maybe stay as the office. Okay. For for my notes, and I and I want to make sure I take care of you. Is 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 the third is the fourth guest or is this the third guest bedroom and the fourth overall room is is that a non negotiable? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I'm okay with if if we can't do it. I mean, you know, we're not going to be in COVID forever, and we're going to go back to the office, so it's not like it's we have to have it. Okay. So what what are your thoughts on this? Well, I know we kind of discussed a lot of different things, but what are your thoughts on if we downsize just a little bit on that fourth bedroom, give you a little extra room when it comes to your overall, you know, your bedroom itself, the two other bedrooms, and be able to take care of, you know, the kitchen as well. Okay. I mean, is that going to knock off $300,000 though? It, it it won't, but it'll give us a lot closer to that. Okay, cool. And let's just stop it there. So Chris, walk me through your mindset. What What were you trying to do there? What I was trying to do was, Recognize that this person had an expectation of spending six hundred thousand dollars, and I came in at the million dollar mark to take care of their dreams. All right, so I also then wanted to go ahead and frame the situation, let them know that I've taken care of this problem before, and and ask them where they feel like they felt in that box. Right, so I painted two boxes and allowed themselves to put, put themselves in one of them. Hey. Some people out there are saying, by no means at all, am I ever going to compromise on what I want? This is what I want. And we got to figure this out together to get what I want. Or is it along the lines of, hey, I'm kind of more price conscious. And I know that there may be some limitations to what I want. So I had this idea, but I'm willing to take a step back on that as well. I love that you did that because I, I find a lot of people, what they do is they go into this arrogance mode and they go, whoa, you you want a $600,000 home. I'm sorry. You want a million dollar home for $600,000? Like not everybody can afford us. And they jump into conclusions instead of saying, well, let's, let's dial it back a little bit. Let's reverse engineer. So the fact that you started to work within the money that I had, and I recognize, you know, that there are, or we all need to recognize that there are minimum job yeah. sizes that we can do. So, so if somebody says, look, I, I only have $200,000 on this home and your homes start at 400 grand, yep. there's not much that you're going to want to do for that because it's just not worth it. And I'm probably at that point, I'm just going to fall on the sword and say, Hey, can I be straight up with you? Like our minimum job is around $450,000. And and I know you talked about $200,000. I guess like, what do you feel like we should go from here? Yeah, I, I was, and this is going back to the whole, like having stuff done up front. Like I was going to schedule something today with a software company. And they said, Hey, if you are not doing these numbers, don't bother. And I was like, great. Guess what? We didn't do. I didn't waste their time and they didn't waste my time. 
And they were just, I mean, so once we get to that threshold, then I'll re-engage and say, great, I'm ready to go forward now. I've worked up to this point, but I'm just not there. And it's not my fault. It's not their fault that we're not a good fit. It's just, we got boundaries. Yeah. And you didn't have to deal with the embarrassment of going there and finding out, okay, well, hey, we're not the best fit. And they didn't have to waste their time, you know, dealing with you, the correspondence back and forth to find out after, you know, 30 minutes of time that, you know, Logan's not the best fit for us right now. Yeah. So I love that they did that. They did it up front. And I think that's something that the embarrassment side is what we forget about is that when somebody goes, oh, I was only thinking five grand and you're coming at me with a $20,000 bathroom, they're embarrassed because now they had to say no. Nobody likes to say no to somebody else. Like it's just, it's not in our natural DNA to, to want to do that. So for as awkward as it is for you as a contractor, it's equally as awkward for the homeowner. And that's why the homeowner then just ghosts you over and over and over because they don't want to be the bearer of bad news. So they'd rather just not even deal with it and just leave you on red. And to kind of go back again, like what the overall goal for that was, I was looking to help handle that objection together. All right. Find out really what was going on in their world. Like what were they, what were they planning on using these things for? Hey, let me be your guide. Let me be your guide to help take some things off. You ask the question, is taking away one bedroom going to, you know, stop it? The reality was no. But I, I can be confident in saying that. But hey, it's going to get us a little closer. And then we can kind of dial back from that. Okay, cool. You feel good on the price one? Let's do it. You want to do the, uh, let's, I got to talk to my spouse. I got to talk to my accountant. I got to talk to somebody else. Yes, do it. You want to do it? Yep. All right, I'll be the contractor and you be the homeowner. All right, sounds good. Okay. Hey, yeah, so I, I, that sounds pretty good, man. Uh, what, I, what I need to do is I, I, I need to talk to my, my spouse about all this, but I appreciate, I appreciate your time. Yeah, man, of course. Uh, I'm curious, Chris, what are you looking to talk to your spouse about? Oh, well, well, I just got to talk to Megan because that's just kind of how we always do things. And, you know, and I, I don't know. I just got to kind of talk to her about everything you said. Okay. What do you think Megan is going to say about our conversation? <laughs> Honestly, she's going to say it's, it's, it's quite a bit of money. Okay. And, and I'm just curious, Chris, how important in this decision is she? Uh, definitely, definitely important. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to make this decision together. So it's definitely important. Okay. And that makes sense because in my household, it's the same thing. So what if we get Megan on the phone right now and the three of us can chat? How would that work? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that would be a good idea. I mean, right now she's probably out right now with a, with her newborn and I don't know if she can be on the phone right now, but, but I think definitely having a conversation together would be important. Okay. I like that, Chris. And, and do you mind if I share why? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Because in my role, Chris, I get it. I'm married too. I understand how it all works. And I know for me, if I go back to my wife and just say, hey, honey, we're going to do this for 20 grand. She's going to not hear the entire conversation that you and I just had. Yeah. All she's going to hear is $20,000. And if you go back to Megan and say that, what do you think she's going to say? Yeah. Same thing. She's going to be like, yeah, we were talking about 12 and it's, now it's 20. Yeah. And for you, Chris, realistically, what's your you know, what's your thought on all this? Is this something that you're really looking for? Yeah. I mean, we, this hall bathroom has been a pain in our butt for some time. And, and I think if we can just go ahead and knock it out, it's huge. I mean, I, I even thought about doing it on my own, but it's just daunting. And that's not something I want to do. What's Megan's thought on this. Does she want you to do this? Yeah. I mean, she's, she's, she, <laughs> I called because I kind of know this stuff a little bit better than she does, but but yeah, we both have an interest in doing this. I mean, this kids growing up and and having right now we're you know washing the baby in, in our own master bath. But in a couple of years, we need to have this taken care of, and and we're having family visit more now. And the the hall bath is just pretty bad. Okay, that makes sense to me. What's the motivating factor for Megan? I guess why does she want this done? Stop! It's not being a headache. Stop having to have guests come over and use our either downstairs bathroom or you know, to shower, they kind of use our master. I mean, we had several people, you know, friends and family come over that decided to even get hotels rather than stay with us. Man, what's that like? Uh, not great. I mean, it's something we should have taken care of a long time ago, but, you know, kids and everything kind of transitioning in life, we kind of figured this out. But like I said, I, I just didn't, I, we didn't know it was going to cost 20000 so that that's something we just didn't know. Okay. I'm just curious, before hopping on this call, I guess, what did you and Megan discuss about what you were hoping to invest in this? We really didn't. I mean, I was thinking a budget of around 12, mm -hmm. um, did a little bit of like, you know, 
researched online and saw something on like I think it was like Thumbtack or whatnot. It said mm-hmm. around twelve thousand dollars was average, and I thought it would probably be getting the average. But um, from what you said, I mean, I see the value. I just, uh, you know, it's more than we originally thought. Okay, how do you feel about this conversation that you and I just had? Good. I think it's got to convince Megan. Okay. Cool. So I'm happy to hop back on the phone with the two of you guys. When do you want to make that happen? Uh, so she's free on Wednesdays. Um, I mean, guess, I mean, are you free on Wednesdays too? Yeah. I mean, so that's tomorrow. So uh, we can chat tomorrow. What time works for you? Uh, maybe two. Okay. Now between now and tomorrow at two o'clock, what's going to stop the three of us from hopping back on that phone call? I, I, I need to get a hold of Megan in. And, and, and let her know we're having that call and not let anything get in the way. Okay. Because what I don't want to have happen, I don't want to blindside her with all this stuff with all because I know what we're talking about is a little bit different than what you guys have maybe talked about before. But I want to make sure that, you know, we go through all this together to make sure that with this bathroom, it's exactly what you and Megan both want. And we can talk about the pricing again then. Yeah. True. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think hopping on a call tomorrow together would probably be easier for us to kind of She'll be able to ask, ask her questions as well and yeah. uh, be able to get some clarity on that. Okay, beautiful. And in the meantime, between now and tomorrow at two o'clock, would it help if I just send over a video of a project that's pretty similar to the one that we just talked about that you're looking to have done? Actually, yeah, that'd be huge, especially I can be able to show Megan as well. Okay, cool. So is this your cell phone? Yeah, it is. Okay, I'll shoot it over to you and we'll talk tomorrow at two o'clock and I'll just give you a call. All right, sounds good, Bill. Cool, thanks. Thanks, man. I, that was good. Um, but before I say that, what are your thoughts? What was your kind of goal behind it? So my goal is to essentially humanize the situation. We all have to talk to our spouse. And, and typically, I, I had one of two ways I was going to go with that. It was either going to go the soft, gentle route, where and, and that's the vibe you were giving me. Or the other vibe would have been, hey, Chris, aside from talking to your wife what or Megan, what else is going to stop you from moving forward? To get the real reason. To get the real, deep down reason of... Well, it's just a lot more money that I that I wanted to spend, and then we would have jumped back into the price objection one, which would have spiraled, you know, back to that. But I just didn't want to redo the same role play, mm-hmm. but just a little bit better. Um, <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> even Aaron's laughing at that one. <laughs> Aaron's shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> so with the spouse one, I wanted to humanize the situation and just go, Chris. I get it, man. In my house, it's it's pretty similar, right? If I go back to my wife, so essentially what I'm trying to do is. This is not an objection that happens once every blue moon. This happens so commonly, and the reason that people do it, again, we don't want to make assumptions in sales. At the same time, if 90% of people are giving you this objection, I'm sorry, if everybody's giving you this objection, 90% of the time, it's the same thought process Yeah. where they just they don't want to go back and tell the spouse the, the number, but the spouse wasn't on the call. So if I can essentially call out their problem but put it on myself, or go talk about another, hey, can I share with you what another homeowner did in this situation? Sure. So all I'm trying to do is humanize the situation, let you know that the feelings that you're having are valid because in my house, it's the same thing, and then guide you through what's important to not only you, but even more importantly, what is important to Megan. I want to set that follow-up call, and I want to make sure in between now and then, I know if you go back and say, Megan, it's 20 grand, she's going to say, I'm out. So I want to make sure we kind of guide the situation to make sure that we don't have that scenario. And that's also why I said, can I shoot you over a video to try to at least nurture a little bit more to get her more excited to at least have a discussion about what's going to happen. And I liked how you framed it where all the different activities towards the end were positioned towards me. It was like, hey, let's let's work together to be able to solve this problem for you and Megan. Like you have you have the big responsibility to be able to to do a lot of the you know the burden to figure the situation out but megan's going to be involved too let's make sure she she is involved and she's taken care of so that you become out the hero as well yeah so the spouse one you're gonna have it with the spouse i've heard it well i gotta talk to my accountant I'm like what your accountant about what well i gotta i gotta see if i have the money here okay and in, in our world we talk to business owners it's like okay time out blunt question do you know how much money you have in your bank account right now for the business Oh uh, yeah, I do. Okay, well, if you know how much you have in your bank account, I guess what's what's the showstopper here? That's when I would go a little bit more on the aggressive, yeah. hard aggressive line of like, okay, so clearly you have the money, but you're still asking your accountant 
hey, I'm just curious, what else do you have to ask your accountant about? Oh, uh, well, we just have taxes are coming up. Okay. What do you think you're going to spend in taxes? Well, I have no idea. Okay. So let's go through that because here's what I'm trying to understand. And I like, I like calling out what I think is the obvious. I'm trying to understand, do you actually not know how much you're going to pay in taxes? So that's a real situation, which if, if that's the case, we got a bigger issue here because you have no idea how much money is going in and out of the bank account. Or are you really just a little bit hesitant because this was not the amount of money that you were looking to spend? Yeah. And if you just call it out, you know, I've done it before where it's like, oh, that's well, 10 grand. I, I don't know. I, I can't spend that. Okay. Blunt question. Do you not see the value in the, in what we're selling? Or do you literally not have $10,000 in your bank account? Because if they say, I literally don't have 10,000. That's a totally different conversation. That's a very different conversation than, well, I don't, I have a hundred thousand. I don't see the value. Then it's not a price objection. It's a clarity objection. So a lot of times the, it's the surface level of what they're giving you is not actually, it, it, I, when I say a lot of times, it's never the surface level. It's yeah. never, oh, that's a lot more money. Well, it's not a lot more money. People are not afraid to spend the money. People are afraid that it's not going to be what they want yeah. or they're, it's, they're not understanding that it's actually going to solve the deep down problem, not the problem of it's an outdated kitchen, but the problem of I want to make memories with my family before my kids graduate high school. Yep. So the spouse one, it's big. You're going to get it a lot. Biggest thing there is if you can have it up front, you know, especially like, cause I, I've heard Chris do role plays with people where they say, Oh, like, or, and Chris will give them the objection of, I got to talk to my spouse and they go, well, let, let me do this. Let me text you a couple just photos of this and that. And the reason I did the video one in this case is video is going to hit a little bit harder. What I would have probably done, especially if you have a CGN thing, send over the website. Hey, let me just send that over to you because that, that essentially walks through the entire journey of what the buyer is thinking and feeling. Yep. And that will call out their pain and what they're looking to have done from a solution standpoint, the same way that we're talking and explaining it now, that's all done up front. So when the wife looks and goes, or Megan looks and goes, well, that's a lot of money, but then she reads the rest of it. She goes, oh, now I get where they're coming from. So to have those little tools in your tool belt versus just saying, okay, great. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Everybody says time kills deals, which is totally true. But if you don't nurture between now and then, that's a much higher chance of getting got. And I think having that process was huge. Like having a process of, okay, we hopped on this phone call. I got this objection. This is what the next step is. The next step is for me to find out, you know, really the importance of having your, you know, spouse or significant other there. And then now let's talk about this and having a process. I'm going to send you over a video. We're going to schedule another call because yeah, it's not right for you to make the decision right now. It doesn't make any sense, but let's nurture you a little bit more because you're just not there yet. And then you're able to find out if I'm really concerned about the price or am I really concerned about Megan or what's what it really looks like for me. So you ready to jump into the last objection that's very common, which is I'm either too busy or I don't have enough time. Yep. Sure. And we're going to do that from the contractor's perspective. It's contract. Again. Yep. Contractor's perspective. So which one do you want to be? It's up to you. Aaron, which one? Who's contractor here? You did, and then you did the inspector. Okay, so right, Chris so. is up contractor. All right, okay. go ahead. Hey, Chris. Uh, yeah, man, I mean, I definitely want to do it, but um, now is just, you know, not the right time to do this. And what, and what do you mean by that? Well, you know, we're it's, it's May. We're about to go on summer vacation and everything. So realistically, I'm looking to have this kitchen done maybe, I don't know, sometime early next year. Okay. Sometime early next year. Okay. What, what was the big motivation for you to reach out? I guess now. Um, I guess just to look into the process of this or understand how it all works. Like I'm a, I'm kind of a planner. So mm -hmm. I was just trying to get a good understanding of, you know, maybe get a couple estimates and then see what it costs and then kind of make a decision from there. Gotcha. Sounds like you're doing your research. Yeah. I'm, yeah, exactly. Can, can I ask you a pretty blunt question? Sure. What what are you planning to solve? So most of them I talk to people and they've got something big going on in their life for them to get a new kitchen. Either it's they got kids that are growing up and they're sick and tired of like, you know, not spending time with their kids, or even they've got a big event coming up and they're they're now hosting it for their family. I guess in your world, like what's going on? Well, I mean, it's an outdated kitchen. You know, I definitely like to spend, you know, open it up like what we talked about, where it's more spacious. 
that we can hang out together as a family so it's not as isolated. And when you say we hang out, like who is that? Uh, myself, my wife, uh, my two kids. Okay. I write down some pretty detailed notes. Um, do you mind sharing your, so I can put in the notes your wife's name? Uh, yeah, Audrey. Audrey. Okay. So you, Audrey, and, and your kids, how old are they? Uh, eight and nine. Eight and nine years old. Okay. When you, what are your thoughts on how you're going to spend time with them in this kitchen? Because if you're building it in the sense of for them, I mean, how are they planning on enjoying this? Um, you know, my wife likes to cook. Mm -hmm. She's big on that. Um, she's pretty traditional from her upbringing. So she's big on like family dinners and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'd like to have a breakfast bar there. I'd like mm -hmm. to a breakfast bar. You said, I, 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 I don't hear that too often. Uh, I mean, we do breakfast bars, but people actually knowing that like right off the top, well, that they want that, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, I just like, um, you know, I, I'll just give you, so last year we were in, uh, or I guess two years at this point, uh, we were actually down in Cancun for a vacation mm -hmm. and it was super cool. Cause the room that we had there, it was nice where we could cook. And then in the room, they actually had a high table that was like a breakfast bar that our kids would sit there and enjoy. So it was like, it was super cool to have a breakfast bar there. So it was nice. All right. Sounds like you, you were spending a lot of time with these kids. Yeah. I mean, we were trying to be pretty present in their life. I, I recognize that, you know, with social media and stuff like that, it's very easy to kind of, you know, go into our phones and get wrapped up into it. So the more that we're able to, I don't know, I guess, foster an environment of communication. That's really what I'm, I'm hoping for here. Okay. You... And I know you talked about doing it. When did you say next year? At what time? Uh, just, I mean, I'm not in a huge rush on this, you know. Um, so, I don't know. It's May, maybe like February, January, February of next year, just after the holidays. Okay. Just curious. How long do you feel like a, a kitchen remodel would take? Um, I don't know. Like a couple months. <laughs> you ready for some good news? Uh, yeah. So, generally with us... The whole process is about two weeks long, actually, the build. Uh, we do everything we can to get you, you know, you have to be outside of your home for, or outside of your kitchen for a little bit. About that two weeks, we set you up with some stuff. But most of them I talk to people and they feel like it's a lot bigger of a deal than they're actually going through. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Like, I like the, you know, it's two weeks is great, but still, like, I just, you know, I kind of want to wait a little bit on this. Okay. Just, just curious. Um, what what are your what are your thoughts on what this cost? I mean, have you gone over it all on what you're kind of planning on spending at all or um yeah, I mean that's something I gotta talk to my wife about. I guess we're probably looking at, I don't know, maybe like twenty five or thirty grand. And I know what you know, what you gave me was something closer to fifty or sixty. So part of it's trying to plan and save up for that amount. Um, you know, go that route. Okay. Is that fifty or sixty, um, is is that something you guys are set on getting what we kind of described the scope of work we, we worked on or you guys are looking for is a 50 or 60, something that just totally outside of you guys' budget. No, I mean like 50 or 60 is not totally outside of our budget. It's just, you know, I got to save up for it. I'm pretty big on not overspending, you know, okay. when I don't have to necessarily. Okay. So, and I want that kitchen. I'm okay with taking a couple of things away maybe, but like I really want that kitchen. I've been pretty meticulous about what's on that list, like our desire list. Um, and I'm good again, I'm good with waiting until that time. I just want to make sure that we have the money saved up. Okay. Have you guys already done some material planning and things like that as well? Uh, no. Okay. What are your thoughts on this? It, it sounds like you guys are pretty bought in on getting this kitchen. Uh, you know, getting it for you and your family is super important. Uh, but maybe finding out a little bit later on the date to be able to save a little bit, little money and kind of go through with that. Sometimes we're booked out. Sometimes, you know, we kind of have different times. Would it make sense for us to kind of talk about maybe securing a certain spot in your calendar? Is there something, a certain event that's coming up? Um, there's no event coming up necessarily. Um, just, you know, I want to get this done and probably within the next year. Okay. When's the latest? You're like, absolutely. There's no way I'm ever going to say, I'm never, I don't want to step a foot in my kitchen if it's not done at this point. Maybe this time next year. Okay. This time next year. So a year from now, if we're out, pushed out a little bit. Um, okay. I'm looking at that. Would it help if I kind of, we kind of nurtured together in the meantime? Yeah. Okay. Because what I'm, what I'm hearing is there's a lot of different things. So 
it, who else is going to be involved in it? You said you and your and my wife and you and your wife. Yeah. Is is she playing at all in the kitchen as well? Or um, she likes it, but she's pretty busy with work, so she's essentially just kind of hands off and letting me do it. Can I tell you that's kind of surprising to hear, and I, I don't hear that often. So that's why it's it's, it's surprising to kind of hear that because most of the time I'm hearing people like they spend a lot of time in the kitchen together, and it's like normally the cooking's like a, a family kind of event, so they both kind of have say in it. Yeah. So I mean, I work from home, and mm -hmm. she works in the office. So I'm home a lot. Gotcha. She's really only there in the mornings and evenings. I mean, and then obviously weekends and stuff like that. So the goal is to, you know, make it that when she comes home, it's nice, it's easy. She still likes to cook and stuff like that, but um, it's a more inviting environment. So hopefully she won't be working as late. Okay. And right now, what, what's going on in your world right now that that's not nice and inviting? It sounds like it's just, it's small. It's just an old kitchen. Um, it's not functional for what we're looking to do. This is probably out of place, but I sometimes hear people talk about like even the, the kitchen size sometimes even causes arguments and stuff. I hear all types of wazoo things. Yeah, we don't really argue that much. Um, so that's not really an issue. Gotcha. I'm, I'm glad it's not. Glad it's not. What, what are your thoughts on this? So it sounds like you guys looking for a kitchen to go for with everything. You know, how about we do this? I want to send you over some stuff so that you're not blindsided by anything. So that this time next year, there's a kitchen sitting in your home. You know, you guys are actually able to utilize it. Um, you know, do you got, do you read at all? Is it mostly videos? How do you normally look at your research? Um, I'm definitely a reader. Okay. Definitely a reader. So I like to check out, you know, forums and blogs and stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. So we do have a couple of blogs um, on our website that talks about like different trends, maybe kind of what drives the cost up or drives the cost down so that you can be able to sh share that with Audrey so that she's able to also understand as well. What are your thoughts on me sending that over to you? Uh, yeah, it'd be great. Okay. So what I'll do is I'm going to put you in our pipeline. And what that means is I'm going to reach out to you quite often. Um, not overbearingly, but I want to make sure that, you know, sometimes people talk about communication and they feel as if the contractor kind of dropped off. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out a blog to you uh, today right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reach out to you. And what I want you to be comfortable with, because sometimes I talk to people and they said, hey, we've kind of gone another direction and things like that. I want you to be comfortable at some point if you feel as if you guys are going to go in another direction, be able to let me know that so that I don't feel like I'm chasing you and you don't feel like you're being chased. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. So you want to just do that? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to send that over to you and it sounds good. Okay, cool. So out of role play, Chris, what was the uh, thought process there? Well, I was trying to find out how important this was to you. I, I tried to dig a little deeper and to see if there was any real pain that you're dealing with. Um, it sounded like you were uh, the person that was dealing with it the most. You did spend a lot of money and time for the family. And so I thought in my mind, like right now, it's I don't think you're going to realistically going to wait all the way until next year. Uh, but it's just you guys were not expecting to spend that right now. And so having to justify that was a, was a big burden to do. Yeah. So I liked that you set it up for the future. Hey, like this is what we're going to do. This is when we're going to do it. In the meantime, I'm going to nurture you. So I liked how you did that. And you even gave a reason not for like a, hey, I want to make sure that you don't, you know, forget about me. But it's like, hey, I want to make sure that you don't feel like I messed up. So that was fantastic. Um, the only thing that I would have added to that is I would have done one of two things. I've done two things. One is, hey, like, okay, so you're looking at 30. Like if what we talked about, you know, if I would have come back with 30. Could you have done that? Yeah. What would, what would you have done then? Because if they would have said, oh, I still would have waited until next year, then it's, it's really going to be tough. Then it's a time thing. But if it's like, oh, I would say now, now you know it's a money thing. Uh, only the other side of it is, well, at the beginning we talked about why do you want it? Well, I want to be able to hang out with my kids more before they leave the house and stuff like that. Uh, okay, great. Like, what? how are y'all doing that right now? Yeah, I was trying to dive into a little bit of that kid piece. Um, but I think that um, I think that you're 100% correct that there's – when you, you have to find out what the real objection is. So if they give you the surface level of, oh, we want to wait, well, hey, in my mind, I was trying to either, if I was either going to try to get you to put some money down now, a small micro commitment towards something, hey, let's go ahead and secure your spot on the calendar uh, with this stuff. And, you know, have you guys done some consultation already on this? All right. Well, hey, it sounds like you guys want to do this. Let's go ahead and put some money down now or vanguard the situation of, hey, I'm going to reach out to you quite often. I'm going to be in your world and because we're going to take care of this together. Right. So that at the very least, if you do go forward with something, you're going to go forward with us or you're going to have to have an active thought of not going forward with us. Yeah. And with all this stuff, I like that. A lot of this just, it, this can be circumvented up front. 
right? If you put your efforts into the 80% of the buying decision, which happens before the actual sales call, then you're good. Yep. But if you're if you're waiting until this point, now Chris kind of has his back against the wall a little bit. Yeah, because if you, you had no idea what this stuff costs, like there's no reason at all someone should be calling you not having an idea or being yeah. to, like being 100% legitimately 100% financially off on what you're what you're costing. Yeah. So all the stuff, the sales process is super important. Everybody focuses on well, how do I deal with the objections? That's all they want to know is because everybody thinks, well, I'm really good at sales. Okay, well, how much sales training have you ever had? Well, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. Oh, okay. I've read a lot of WebMD. I'm not a surgeon. So there's a very difference, a very big difference between practice and actually, you know, I'm sorry, practice of doing it versus just like reading about it. Yeah. So with this stuff, it's so funny when it comes to the objections is objections typically happen near the end of the sales call. Nobody ever talks about what happens before all that stuff happens. Everybody just cares about the objections because they think with the objections, well, that's not a me thing. It's a them thing. They're the ones that are too cheap. So how do I overcome that? They're the ones that are too wimpy to give me a yes or no. So they need to talk to their spouse. They're the ones that don't value their kids' lives. So I need to overcome that. But nobody talks about what happens before the objections happen. And nobody talks about before the sales call happens. Because in reality, the objections is like the last 5% but you're missing the 80% before the sales call and you're missing the 15% before the objections come, you're focusing on the 5% while the real victors here are the ones that focus on the 80%. Then they focus on the 15%. Then at the end of it, they don't really even have objections because you already done all the hard work up front. Yeah, all the questions have been answered. If you had a conversation with someone and you're able to say, hey, do you mind if we kind of adjust the elephant in the room? Yeah, what's that? All right, so sometimes I talk to people and they have no idea what this stuff costs. And just so you have a clear understanding, I guess... Um, is, is it cool if I kind of share with you just an idea of different costs that I've kind of dealt with? All right. So people that work with me have invested everything from $45,000 all the way up to $250,000. What are your thoughts on that? Because if you had a $15,000 budget and I just said 45, oh, well that's 45. Okay. You know what I, we just did? We just saved both of us a whole lot of time. Mm -hmm. We also didn't have to have, you have the embarrassment after going through all these things that you love. And so it, it it's, it's way better to get in front of these things. And if you can do it even before the call, you're doing it the most effective way. Yeah, I like it. Well, cool. Guys, these objections are big. Knowing how to handle them is important. But what's even more important is having an overall process of a sales process, and then also making sure that up front you navigate the waters appropriately. So you shouldn't even have to deal with this. 100%. This should be addressed up front, make it life that much easier. Let's do it. Cool. Guys, Thank you very much. If you have not done so yet, if you liked this conversation and this helped you out at all, do me a favor. Drop a, a review below. Just let us know, hey, how are we doing? Five star, one star. We just want to get a good gauge because what happens then is, first off, it lets us know how we're doing. But also, the more reviews that we get, it's easier for us to then go to big time uh, influencers in the space that know more about this and are, you know can really move the needle to get them on board. But if they go, well, you only have one review or whatever it is, it's very tough because it doesn't look as appealing. So you'd be helping us out, which in turn helps you out to bring you better knowledge. So right now, do me a favor at the next red light that you get to pull over, leave us a review. Thank you very much. See you guys. See ya.